Hi everyone, welcome to MZ Webinars. Today we're continuing our series on T-levels um, and we're going to be discussing how to choose which routes to actually run. Please feel free to add any questions in the box on your control panel at any time and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce MZ's Managing Director, Andy Derman, who is our presenter today. So I'm going to hand over the controls, so over to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I'll just get that sorted. So hopefully you can see my slides now, Debbie? Yeah, lovely. Good, okay, marvellous. So yes, thank you very much. Um, excited to continue our webinar series as we, we certainly continue to think about the emerging T-level agenda um, and the opportunities and challenges that that presents. Um, and so uh, get keen to, to keep talking and, and hearing viewpoints and thoughts. In terms of uh, today's webinar, um, I just want to take a moment quickly to introduce EMSI for those that aren't so familiar with our work and why this is of particular interest to us. Um, let's quickly whiz over some, some background information on T-levels just so we're all absolutely on the same page there. Um, and I'm really keen to, to kind of share, I suppose, some of the early feedback we've had from, from education providers and those interested in, in the skills agenda, um, which has very much shaped our webinar series. And uh, the theme today is very, is very much aimed towards understanding um, whether um, how we might choose to um, our focus around the, the 15 T level routes. And I'll be looking at that from both the perspective of an individual education provider and also throwing in the perspective of a, a broader regional skill system as well before we, we sum up. So very briefly, uh, a quick intro to MZ for those that aren't so familiar. Um, with us, um, our, our, our job, our mission is about helping people to make better decisions when it comes to the, uh, the, the world of work and the labour market. Um, and we, we do that by providing detailed, robust, um, complete uh, labour market information and insight and provide that to, to those, those of you who are critical to helping make good decisions when it comes to uh, careers, education and work. Um, we're working across three key dimensions, um, working with uh, the within the education setting, so both in terms of providing insight to help um, education providers um, understand how to connect into emerging employment demand and align education to employment opportunities, as well as supporting careers advice and guidance. We're working across economic development, including a number of LEPs, um, thinking about the, um, the, the broader regional uh, aspect to skills, particularly as devolution um, develops, but also feeding into uh, investment planning, um, employment um, development, inward investment, and a number of activities that, um, that benefit from understanding the labor market. And, and finally, um, working with organizations in the employment space, including organizations like staffing companies and welfare to work providers, as well as uh, companies themselves, who obviously have an interest in understanding uh, the, the talent landscape and how they can connect into that to support their own growth and development and that of their clients. Um, critical to all of this is, is having a really good insight into, into labor market information, particularly in local areas where um, um, where data can be used to really drive action um, and activity. Um, so we'll refer to obviously some of that as we go through. So let's let's talk about T levels then. Um, so just a quick whiz through where we're at, I suppose, in the history there. Um, back last year, April last year, Lord Sainsbury's um, report on uh, technical education made a number of recommendations. Um, that um, involved um, looking at the technical system and working out how it might be better aligned to reflect um, employment of, um, potential and to address a number of the skills challenges that are, are very broadly uh, discussed um, with a particular focus on, on those middle, uh, middle skills and those leading towards higher, 
higher education, particularly with a, a focus towards um, the, the workforce. Um, the Sainsbury Review uh, came up with a number of recommendations. Um, one of the key key um, abiding principles was very much about clustering um, 15 routes that would uh, simplify the education system and really focus education towards a key set of in, um, occupations um, that, it's the, the, that they can train for there and, and they were clustered into those 15 routes that we'll refer to as we go through. And, and really also reinforcing the role um, uh, the, the role that technical education can play and perhaps the role it, it may not need to play or is, isn't efficient um, in playing. So in selecting the occupations that align into those routes, it's very much focusing on those that do require technical knowledge and skill and that um, uh, a, a number of occupational areas actually fall outside of the uh, of the framework, particularly those at the the lowest uh, skill end of the of the labour market, where um, the the panel uh, had highlighted that perhaps um, too much technical training was 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 overkill there and not a, an efficient use of resources. And I know that's presented some interesting challenge in terms of what what is in and what isn't in, but um, and that's all working through the system as we speak. So that's the the founding principle here, the Sainsbury Review. Um, shortly uh, after that was published, uh, the government published its post-16 skills plan, which in effect endorsed pretty much everything that uh, the Sainsbury panel proposed, um, with the caveat of, um, of budget constraints and limitations there. Um, that fed into statements being made in March, uh, the March budget, where um, T levels were Christened and um, and funding was um, identified specifically to to support that agenda. Um, moving towards now, um, the looking towards the implementation component with um, a phasing of implementation um, through next year onwards. Um, two of the key aspects I think that are, that are currently being piloted and 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 reviewed and and um, considered are. The, the uh, increase in teaching hours associated, uh, as well as um, the need for there to be um, a quality work placement component assigned um, to, to all of the college-based um, provision. Um, there were distinctions drawn throughout this process between certain routes that were intended to be more work-based and apprenticeship-focused um, versus uh, versus those that were more college-based focused. But the, the key was to ensure that there was still strong work um, placement um, elements to the college-based um, um, training aspect, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. I think really that to sum up. Um, this this just return, it becomes another example of, of very much trying to put employers in the driving seat of the skills agenda. We've had the development of uh, the apprenticeships, and particularly around the levy, um, and T levels have a really strong component that's connected into employer demand and putting putting employers at the heart of, of shaping the skill system there. Um, as this agenda has emerged, we've been very interested to talk with uh, colleagues across the, uh, the the skills system, um, notably talking with colleagues in colleges and LEPs to kind of get some consideration of thoughts of what T levels might mean, the opportunities and the challenges. And uh, I suppose we've got kind of three key key uh, findings that have emerged throughout that process from a kind of a, a, a LEP or a broader perspective. Um, very much uh, excited about the potential switch over to T levels as an opportunity to to really ensure alignment with labour market priorities, both in terms of current demand and also um, a lot of the the growth potential that LEPs are pursuing um, there. And 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 it's, it's it's seen, I would suggest, as a as a as a nice extension to the early work as part of the area of reprocess that really brought. Let's combine authorities and education providers together there. So it's an exciting opportunity there. From a college perspective, um, I think a lot of a lot of challenge around the delivery side and, and understanding the the practicalities and the me the funding mechanisms and all of that. But that aside, at this planning stage, I think it's interesting that um, uh, a large default coming through. 
um, in 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 this thinking is is very much about maintaining as broad a curriculum as possible, and a lot of a lot of providers that we've spoken to is talking about you know offering all fifteen routes as a default to 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 the offer there. Um, the third strand, which kind of sits across both labs and and providers themselves, picks out that point I made earlier around work placements and the challenges um, that that might bring. And that was the subject of our previous webinar that some of you may have joined us for. And if you haven't, I'd urge you to um, go to the, the website, um, uh, the webinar section of the website, and you'll find a recording uh, in the past webinars section there with the address on the screen. Um, I won't be going over too much of that today, um, but suffice to say that was an interesting discussion and, and some big challenges certainly emerging there. But today's subject is very much fueled by those first two bullet points and, and, and really I suppose are thinking about what role a knowledge of labour market demand might play in, in trying to um, shape thinking both um, at the college, individual college level, but also from a sort of a localised skill system perspective. So really, just to, to, to sum that piece up before we dig into a few of those examples and some thoughts there, is, is, is really just reflecting once again, employers really at the, at, in the driving seat here, um, the work placement component that we discussed at length in the previous um, webinar, a real potential limiting factor to, to offering T-level routes. We need to find employers who are willing to engage on those, um, on those strands. And so, um, you know, our view is that actually, given that employers are in the driving seat, those that are planning around this really need to be um, clued up on on what demand looks like, particularly um, in relation to their area and their sphere of influence. And so, having having an understanding of the workforce, both in terms of how it looks now and where it's going, is is going to be critical to, to successfully nav navigating through this fundamental change. Um, Labour market data can um, really underpin this. So there are many ways to get that level of insight, connecting directly with employers, speaking with employers, connecting into activities there. But uh, good access to, to, to employment trends will, will certainly help um, test some assumptions, certainly in this early stage, while, while details still um, still emerging. And um, the joy of the, the, the T-level system is that it is very much designed with this in mind. Um, T-levels, um, and it's still at the proposal phase, but each of those 15 routes have a, a set of uh, identified occupations using SOC code, standard occupational classification codes, um, which in turn then link through nicely to data sets about employment and employment trends. So there's a there's a, a logical route between a T level and um, and local employment trends, and that's what um, uh, underpins today's presentation. So what I what I want to do is just bring a, a few examples to life, really, and and dig dig into into the relationship between T levels and employment trends. Um, particularly at that local level, both from the perspective of uh, an individual provider and, and perhaps the catchment that they serve, and then thinking about it from a slightly broader perspective, um, t taking a lep in this example, but, but equally applicable to combined authorities and other logical clusters um, it, that, that form skill systems, and especially with the backdrop of, of the devolution agenda in general, but, but skills being at the forefront of a lot of that. So let's uh, let's let's work through uh, an example here, and um, I'm speaking to you from the wonderful town of Basingstoke, um, where MZ is headquartered. And so I thought I'd make it pertinent to to to, to this area. Um, and the example I work through, and when we come to look at some of the data here, um, relates to the, the the kind of wider Basingstoke area, the the local authorities of Basingstoke and Dean, and also Hart, which. Um, covers sort of fleet and hook that you can see on the map there. So uh, analysis for the time being will, will reflect that area which, which, is, which is largely the, uh, the, the wider urban area of Basingstoke and, and its commuting pattern. So as I mentioned, um, it's possible to make the connections between each of those 15 T-level routes and employment um, and we're using some of our, our data here for that, that lo lo specific to that local area. 
And, and first up, just wanted to pull out what the current workforce looks like if we were to look at it through the lens of T-level routes. So what we can see here is each of the 15 T-level routes with a, an aggregate of employment associated with the SOC codes, the occupation codes that have been clustered into those 15 routes. So for, for Basingstoke, um, we can see that the business and administrative route certainly comes through as one of the, the higher employing areas, um, followed by sales and marketing, legal finance. So very much um, your business focused sectors coming through here. Um, flip side, we can see creative and design, hair and beauty, protective services, actually not large employers locally. So already starting to build a, a sense of the relationship between different education strands and, and employment, the employment profile of the, 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 the Beijing Stoke area. This of course is looking here and now. Um, part of the challenge here and, and with skills planning in general is is we really need to be kind of looking at where things are going as opposed to where they've been or where they are right now. Um, so we build out, as part of bringing that granular insight, we build out a set of forecasts that work at the same, same geographic level that use um, underlying trends affecting not just the locality but industries and occupations in general to, to shape out a, a view of what the the direction of travel is um, for, for local areas and this next uh, slide now um, looks at what our forecasted growth looks like um, for the next five years for example so this would be the period in which T levels come through and will start to, to head towards um, moving students towards the labour market here so um, cutting through that lens what we can see is um, quite a different picture actually um, forecasts suggest that actually some of the strong growth areas are, are construction, uh, probably un unsurprising around social care, um, but also in the catering and hospitality space. And actually some of those larger employing sectors or, or occupational clusters, T-level routes uh, locally here in Basingstoke aren't necessarily the ones that are forecasted to see, see greatest growth. In fact, actually some of them are forecasting maybe some slight shrinkage. Um, so, so uh, very interesting to look at it from a from a different perspective altogether. Um, that said, um, it is important to understand not just where change is happening, but also what the underlying um, employment profile looks like. Hence, why I showed you the first graph. Now, we have a a data set that actually can kind of make can, can, can kind of combine the two components. Um, a data set that we we, we call openings and, and what this does is, is, is um, model um, what we think of as kind of demand um, and this, this slide shows um, our forecasted number of openings for that same five year time period. This captures not just the change, the, the growth or decline trajectory that we're forecasting but also a sense of churn or replacement demand that sits within any um, any occupational area where people are leaving the workforce to move on to retire um, to, 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 to leave the workforce um, for, for whatever reason and so probably gives us a better sense of the number of job opportunities that will emerge over those next five years and so by factoring those two those components together we can we can see the re-emergence of business and administrative and some of those um, uh, uh, business focused um, occupations um, may not necessarily have been the strong growth areas um, but the sheer size of the workforce means there will always be demand there and, and if we're looking for one kind of perspective um, we would certainly recommend the openings as, as the sort of best single indicator of demand um, and, and that's the one we'll stick with as we go through here. So this again helps us um, consider the different routes and, and, and what demand might look like in our area. Um, we, we, we spoke in the previous webinar that you can refer to and I mentioned earlier about how this can start to influence of course where employers might be um, open to connecting with the education system more than others so a good indicator there. Um, and what I've done now is actually just taken that same data but, but, but re, realigned it slightly visually just to kind of look at the variation between where demand is forecast to be greatest all the way through to the lowest and, and, and critically the relativity of all of that. So we've got our business admin uh, uh, looking at sort of over 
2,000 potential opportunities, whereas as we head down right to the end of the protective services, we're looking at um, just a matter of 100 or so in that five-year period, so it's a relatively small demand there. And I've just color coded it into kind of top five, middle five, lower five there, but um, visually helps to understand the variation within that local area. So looked at kind of connecting in the data and thinking about well, what 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 does employment demand look like, and therefore how might that influence our thinking? And 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 to me, this poses some some very interesting questions. I suppose I come back to that default position I mentioned and. A big question has to be, does running all of those 15 routes make sense? Or is it even going to be possible or viable? Um, there's some significant variation between those high demand um, T-level routes and those very low demand T-level routes. Um, and, 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 and naturally developing that further, we might also ask, well, where do we, how do we prioritize routes? Where do we focus our investment, our emphasis? Um, how might we, we look to uh, understand where we should be putting on larger um, class sizes and, and, and be aiming to recruit higher numbers than, than, um, than, than others. So again, whether, the deep, whether we're looking at all 15 routes and distributing there or prioritizing um, certain routes to pursue, um, that kind of insight is, is certainly interesting to influence. But there are broader themes at, at, at play here, of course. Um, we're not starting from zero. We have um, an infrastructure in place. Um, and so uh, another question to, to, to maybe uh, um, to um, contextualize thinking from the employer demand perspective is then how does that fit into what we're already doing? How does that align to our current offer? And our current provision, and critically, how does that align to our areas of expertise? Um, whether that's about, um, you know, the curriculum staff that we have, the facilities, the great links we already have with employers. As I say, we're not starting from from zero here, so um, so I think you know we need to temper those employment trends with also a sense of where our our own strengths as a provider lie. So some, some interesting dimensions, but certainly um, uh, hopefully you'll agree that, that illuminating it with a sense of where the employer demand lies, given that, that the employer angle is so critical, is certainly going to help us challenge in our thinking and prioritization as we go forward. So that's, that, that's, uh, that's thinking about it from an individual provider, thinking about that, that wider catchment and how we might align into that. Um, of course, there is this this other perspective, which is maybe thinking about slightly larger areas, and, and, and particularly, as I said earlier, connecting into the devolution agenda. So, um, so let's look at it from a slightly different viewpoint. Um, Basingstoke is is um, sits centrally within the enterprise M3 LEP area, so I just figured that would be a logical one to to look at. And for those not so familiar, um, the map shows the the coverage of enterprise M3, which um, which goes from, from very much um, M25 um, area, West Surrey, all the way down to um, the New Forest, um, down at the bottom of Hampshire there. So quite a diverse um, economy, quite a broad geographic area there. Um, and so interesting to think about it um, from the perspective of, of the LEP and how they might think about these sorts of things. I've, highlighted here a couple of focus areas which will be examples as we work through so I'm continuing with the Basingstoke and Hart area at the red um, but also highlighting somewhere like the New Forest um, in blue which is um, a significant distance away has um, a, a strong college centered in the middle of there in Brockenhurst College close to Southampton which falls within another LEP area as well so some really interesting dynamics at play here. So let's think about it similarly, but 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 from, from that area-wide perspective. So here's here are the same 15 routes, um, looking at current employment levels, but this time for that whole enterprise M3 LEP area. Um, some usual uh, suspects once again come through here in terms of the business and administrative, legal and finance. We're seeing sales and marketing once again coming through, but also some new ones emerging: engineering and manufacturing, not so big necessarily for Basingstoke specifically, but for the broader LEP area, 
um, a, 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 you know, a large employment area and actually a big focus for a lot of the investment and, and innovation that's happening in this region. So we can start to think, well, there's an aggregate need, but, but we talked about how actually that, that LEP area um, covers quite a diverse set of economies that sit beneath it. And so here's, here's an example of them breaking out those two focus areas, Basingstoke joined by New Forest, to show then current employment levels. So we saw the red bar was Basingstoke, what we saw, is what we saw earlier. Um, interesting to look at the New Forest, the blue bars, where business and admin not so high, um, but we can see uh, social care coming through actually as, a, as an area of, of, of higher employment for example, um, and a few other areas um, coming through where there are variations thereof. Um, skipping on to then coming to this point around the openings that I mentioned earlier as, a, as a, probably the single best indicator, um, I've, I've just kind of run through a profile of those 15 routes rather than looking at absolute numbers for comparability purposes, I've now looked at the distribution of openings um, across those T-level routes. So we can see um, for the LEP as a whole, around about 18%, 19% of, of, of forecasted openings in the next five years are going to fall within that um, business admin area. But let's layer in now Basingstoke to show, show the profile there largely conforms to the Enterprise M3 wide um, area, although slightly higher dominance of, uh, of the sales and marketing component, um, less so on the social care and some of the transport and logistics um, components there. Um, but let's now map in the new forest, and this is where we do start to see quite a different profile coming through, lower on the business and administration, but certainly higher on construction, on engineering and manufacturing and on social care, transport and logistics and proximity certainly to uh, Southampton and the port of Southampton coming through there um, for sure. So what we can see is, is quite considerable variation which might start to encourage us to think about yes you know area wide, LEP wide we need to meet um, particular criteria but also then thinking about how we might distribute that regionally and where we might start to develop centers of expertise or focus. Um, some of these areas, business admin, digital, legal finance might naturally be more relevant to kind of focus towards the Basingstoke area while those others that I picked out um, in the blue might naturally be better to focus around the strengths of the New Forest um, regional economy. Here's another example just picking one of those routes, so that, that, that strongest route, the business is administrative where the, the high volumes of employment are, but also our projected openings like um, are greatest and we can see gradations of blue, the darker the blue is where there's a higher, higher um, higher uh, openings figure for the next five years by local authority. And you can see very obvious clusters around that kind of Basingstoke Winchester area as well as around around Guildford and into Surrey there as opposed to some of the more rural areas that sit between the, the, the towns um, that, that I've picked out in the New Forest as we mentioned. So we can clearly see it's not uniform across the LEP as a whole. Um, there there are quite, quite, quite obvious var variations. So again, you know, presents some interesting, interesting thinking and, and poses some interesting questions which aren't a million miles off what we just asked from the individual provider perspective, um, but starts to think about again, you know, is there a massive demand for all 15 routes as a as, as a, a region, um, and, and will this be possible? But but critically, then, how might we start to prioritise different routes? Um, based on sub-regional variations in demand and where ultimately where the employment is or, or is most likely to be. Um, and once again, how does this then align with the current provision that sits across the region? Are these well aligned or actually are there opportunities here to refocus and realign? And how do we connect again into areas of expertise? Um, certainly be helpful if, uh, for example, Basingstoke College really um, and Guildford colleges had really strong uh, curriculum facilities and links into that business admin, um, probably less less so in other areas, but does that actually bear fruit, is that actually happening? Um, some really interesting questions and, and certainly starting to overlay that information together will, 
will start to really shape um, not just how we meet these these opportunities locally, but but how we best manage it over a, a, a region, and how do we play to existing strengths as well as labour market strengths to really shape our towns. So two examples, looking at fairly similar things, but from slightly different perspectives, um, and 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 really that was kind of the. Uh, the crux of what I wanted to, to, to share today, um, certainly from what we've been thinking and, and, and from our conversations with, with providers as well as um, with, with, uh, with, with LEPs themselves. Um, so really, let, let's just reflect on a couple of those things. Um, talked about, you know, and keep reflecting on how it's very much employers in the driving seat and therefore it, it is really critical to understand how the T-level routes map through those employment trends and start to think about you know, those underlying trends that sit, sit, sit beneath the headlines there. And, and really, I suppose, I see this as a, a challenge to the default position of, of offering all 15 routes through the pragmatic realities of the, um, things like the work uh, placement requirements, etc. It's going to be putting pressure on that. And so, we might want to think about specialization and collaboration and how do we all win? Well, um, maybe this is the perfect opportunity um, for, for, for LEPs and, and other clusters um, and groupings of organizations, skills organizations to come together and really have a, a, a fairly pragmatic conversation about where specializations and collaboration can work for the greater good as well as the individual good. So we can make sure we cover as many bases as possible, give our students and, and future students the best opportunities, but also recognize that we, we, we need to work around the limitations and the challenges that the, um, the, the T-level proposal set here. Um, and I think, you know, certainly being on the front foot about this is going to be helpful. But that does pose an, an, another interesting question, which is, of course, there is this, this, this third dimension, one being employer demand, second being, um, you know, current provision and areas of expertise and, and, and the third dimension of course uh, and probably the most critical is then how do we connect this back into student demand and, and how do we make that those connections there um, and and really I suppose um, visually representing that you know we've, we've looked primarily at employment trends here but, but reference that curriculum expertise um, there will be overlaps but there will naturally be gaps the nature of these things and then let's overlay where students lie um, and the challenge of course is to find our sweet spot you know the, the great place to be is where where those three components overlap um, our challenge going forward is if if employment trends are going to be in, uh, such a critical factor to all of this how do we start to bring the expertise the curriculum expertise more in line um, to cover more of the green how do we bring the students um, with us and, and shape and align student demand again further towards the green so that we can better align um, what, what, uh, what tomorrow's uh, students are keen to pursue and interested to learn uh, career trajectories to follow and how do we align that with where the expertise lies and the opportunities lie. Um, so. Um, some, some big challenges here, but, but our view and, and my view particularly is if we can start with those employment trends as the limiting factor, let's use that to shape curriculum activities and let's use that to influence thinking around the student demand as well. Um, and that's, that's certainly a big role that labour market data can play, both in terms of informing the strategy while we're at the front end of this, but, but critically starting to switch over into delivery mode and focus there. And that's an area that we are working with a number of providers already and LEPs and organizations on. And we'd, we'd love to share with you in more detail. And we're confident we have the right tools and processes in place to, to certainly support that as, as well as other agendas here. Um, we'd be delighted to talk to you some more. In terms of looking forward, I think the student, um, the student view of things is, is particularly important and, and is going to be the subject of our, our next webinar um, in the T-Level series. Um, so a date for your diary and feel free to visit our webinars page to sign up for that. Um, Wednesday 6th of September, again 2 o'clock. Um, and we'll be sort of exploring that third dimension um, in terms of thinking about the role that data can play 
in um, in shaping um, and and encouraging um, I think student demand to to align with where the opportunities, the great opportunities lie, particularly at a local level, where we can start to make those real connections between the education on offer and you know excellent careers. Um, high. Okay.